sure there's nothing that inspires you more on your holidays than the thought of a banker with a PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> and a pile of obscure books. Uh, this is a great example of how vanity can sometimes get the better of you. Um, I was sitting in the office of Martin Shanahan at the IDA last year. We were celebrating uh, 200 years in business, and very kindly, uh, Minister Dunny, who had agreed to come and open our celebration in Ireland, and I casually turned to Martin in his office, and I said, oh, you know, because bankers engage in boastfulness from time to time, and said, uh, you know that the Browns were investors in uh, the fourth transatlantic cable, indeed in the first, second, and third. And he goes, oh really, that's very interesting, and then left that. The next thing, Leonard Hobbs appears at my door and yeah. says, <laughs> um, you know the thing you said about the transatlantic cable? Um, so that explains a little bit uh, my presence. Uh, when Leonard told uh, my assistant, Davina, that it was 45 minutes, I said, that can't possibly be true. Um, I might, I usually speak for an hour to people who are paid to listen to me. I'm not sure that the, uh, the general public will be embracing uh, the opportunity to listen to this over the next 45 minutes. Indeed, on Monday, when I was finally put, preparing my remarks, my daughter grabbed the agenda and she said, that can't be true. It must mean four or five minutes. Um, so I'm standing here because I am that, what I used to, I set out in life aspiring to be this, an internationalist, a globalist, uh, someone who uh, was not going to be confined necessarily by the geographic limitations of the island of Ireland. Um, my mother is here at me today, she will remember this event more than myself, but I was a born in O'Connell Street at the, in the Rotunda, um, work on Herbert Street and live in Ranla. And that's a very tiny geographical triangle. But in the last 30 years, within that triangle, I've managed to actually live in the world. And I'm going to give a little uh, talk about what made that possible, the ideas that sat around that, and why it might be the case. So you might ask the question, where does a globalist live? Here's the answer. Um, oh, here's not the answer. Let's move to a different phase. There is the answer. Um, I spend about 150 days a year traveling around uh, supporting our business. Uh, Brown Brothers Harriman is the last uh, privately owned bank on Wall Street. There are 31 of us. We are joint and severally liable for the obligations of the firm. And as I said, we are entering in uh, 2019, the third century of operating in that form. In that regard, we're something of an anomaly. We're not only the oldest privately held bank in America, we're now the only privately held bank in Wall Street. So we're the oldest, uh, the youngest, the largest, uh, the smallest. But the firm was founded uh, by Irishmen. And this is our Irish office uh, on Herbert Street. Uh, and it's a place that I spend, uh, that's the one corner of that tiny triangle that I talked about. But I spend the rest of my time uh, in this room and uh, this is the Partners Hall of Brand Brothers Harriman. It's at 140 Broadway. It used to be at 59 Wall Street uh, until 2001. And we moved in 2001, just after the 9-11 uh, attacks. And some of the employees said, listen, this is a really bad time to move. Why are we moving from 59 Wall downtown? And uh, the answer was our lease had, was up. We had a 100-year lease, and it had expired. So um, I think that there are relatively lit few businesses that can talk to that length of tradition and duration of process. And the picture on the wall there, the story I'm going to tell today is about the link between me, Mr. Parker, there's my in-tray, um, and the four or five men who were on the wall behind. Uh, that man is a man called Alexander Brown, and uh, he was born in Ballymena. And that picture is here in this little book. This is a book that was published over a century ago describing the work of Alexander Brown and his sons, uh, George, uh, William, John, and James. And so, unlike myself, he was not a practitioner of the Catholic faith. He was a good uh, Presbyterian from Northern Ireland. And he uh, was born in 1764 uh, in the little town of Ballymena. Get this going here. Uh, and was engaged in the linen trade, the primary trade uh, in Belfast at the time. He had an office on Linenhall Street, 
and he moved with his family, who were traditionally in that, a uh, good Presbyterian family at the end, uh, at the end of, that, of that time. And we were engaged in the production, what was a significant industry at that time in Northern Ireland, the production of flax and the pre presentation of uh, fine linens. Belfast, of course, at that time was a location of extraordinary political turmoil. And Conal O'Cleary has just done a fantastic book uh, called The Star Man about this great Presbyterian and Catholic agitation that occurred around that time, around the United Irishman's Revolution. And that caused Alexander to leave Northern Ireland and to move to Baltimore, where an extraordinary Protestant migration had taken place during those years. In fact, uh, when we describe this as Irish, there is a delineation in Irish America. Uh, this is merely what I think they call Scots-Irish, uh, the Presbyterian, Scottish Presbyterian tradition. And when you begin to think about the kind of loss of commercial intellect that occurred in Ireland, that transfer of this incredible mercantile class uh, who moved to Baltimore, which was a kind of a great trading port, then Alexander with his sons began to set up branches around America in Philadelphia, in Baltimore, and in New York. And our firm, uh, Brown Brothers Harriman and Company, traces its origin to this founding in Baltimore in 1818, where and bankers don't like to admit this necessarily, amongst the list of goods, the mercantile goods that Brown had for sale were fine linens, brown hollands, sheeting, and diapers. Now, that's not necessarily the most glorious origin for any banking uh, uh, family, but you've got to start somewhere. Uh, whoops. That's a denial of service attack. Um, the firm was celebrated over the course of the next 20 years, and it largely moved then from a mercantile to a banking uh, type, type of business. And in America, in order to conduct, uh, to, uh, conduct a banking license, one had to be backed by another business. So if you think about the bank of the Manhattan Company, which became Chase Manhattan Bank, was the water supply company into New York City, chemical, manu chemical bank manufacturers Han Hanover, etc. You begin to see this extraordinary underpinning of the merchant classes with the banking classes. And in the 18, in uh, 1900, this book was published celebrating the first 100 years of the operation of the bank, and it's pretty dry going. You really want to be a specialist to um, understand the nature of what the business was like. But Alexander had sent his son, William, to Liverpool to take advantage of the other side of the trade. Um, and when the partnership was founded in 1818, it always says that ours was a firm that had a transatlantic dimension, a global dimension to its thinking from the start. And that influences, in many ways, the way you think about trade, the way you think about the influences that exist in your world, and therefore the sources of information that need to govern what it is that you are going to do. And the brands became significant investors in sailboats, in steamships, and then ultimately that led to their view. Um, there's not much of entertainment to be found in some of these books of histories, and we've been spending the last year uh, rewriting our history, bringing it up to date to 2018. But I thought I might share this little vignette, which comes from a, pos a, a chapter called A Gossipy Chapter of the Early Days. Now, believe me, this is not going to make it to the Comic Festival of Montreal, but the, um, it starts, there are, numbers of letters, there are a number of letters referring to Madame Elizabeth Patterson, it's also anonymous, and to JNB. These references are, of course, not to this audience, but of course, to the lovely Betsy Patterson of Baltimore and her son, Jerome Napoleon Bonaparte. That part of, a, of the world that loves a lover knows well the romance of Jerome Bonaparte of France and Miss Betsy Patterson of Baltimore. When the gallant and handsome young lieutenant was serving in the French Navy in 1803 and was cruising off the West Indies, war broke out with England. With his suite, he came to America and traveled through the United States. And when in Baltimore, he saw at the Govan races Miss Betsy Patterson, who he declared was the most bewitching creature that he had ever seen. He was later introduced to her at the home of one William Chase, and then he married her. The marriage did not suit his brother, Napoleon, then first consul, and in a few months to become emperor of France. The emperor ordered Jerome to return and expressed his determination to throw him into prison. Now, the marriage did not end well, and the banking archives of Brown Brothers Harriman contains this rather dry concluding note in 1839 on the, 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 
the uh, out offspring of this particular marriage, to William and James Brown and Company, will you please transfer 87 pounds, 10 shillings and 7 pence to the credit of J.N. Bonaparte as cash May 24th next. We have been told he has gone to France with the view of offering for the French contract for tobacco. If he gets it at the present high prices, it will ruin him. Now, <laughs> bankers have been in the business of offering that type, type of advice and that type of presence uh, over, over, the last, over, over the centuries. But the, um, the Browns realized that their business need to evolve. And as they evolved from a primarily mercantile uh, business, they started issuing things called commercial letters of credit, bankers' acceptances, and foreign exchange. Um, and the foreign exchange business became what I would think is the core business of the firm at that time, uh, and allowed for people to, what about technology is moving from here, um, Let me get back. And at that time, I'm going to skip this piece, we issued what were called um, travelers, uh, travelers Credits. And this was an important component of the value of issuing the telegraphic uh, business. They had become investors in this, in this business in the first telegraphic cable, again in the 1850s, and again through 1860s. Sorry, I'm having technological problem. But I think, Minister, we actually gave you one of these at the event. What it enabled the firm do is issue credit for the foreign travelers who were going on the grand tour. Uh, travelers were advised to keep this most carefully in their hand, and in the inside, was a letter of credit, which could then came with a very important thing, the tourist's telegraphic code, which was a handbook of secret codes that enabled individuals to communicate on various topics across the cable. Each of the offices uh, in New York, uh, Boston, Phil uh, Philadelphia, and Baltimore had their own code. And then travelers could, would go and register when they arrived in Britain, in London, at 123 Pall Mall, which was the address of Brown Shipley and Co., and register that they were uh, here and present and ready to accept correspondence uh, on their way. There's rather some sexist advice here about ladies giving directions should to prevent mistakes, which I thought was a kind of a slightly <laughs> unnecessary um, component, which I apologize to all our clients who we gave this to in 2018. Um, but it contains codes on various topics from traveling health, money, names, and special phrases. So if you wish to communicate that all was going well, you would put in the telegram, Sherbert. <laughs> uh, if you said that you had arrived, you said, showed Pip. If you say that you've arrived as well as could be expected, you wrote, showed Pip shooty. Um, or the unfortunate, I have died, shrivel. Um, <laughs> but this uh, codified communication to a network of banks was really made possible because of the existence of the telegraphic cable, because of the interplay of um, this information. We had uh, an information advantage as owners of steamships in the 1820s, because we could, uh, news and money and information traveled at the speed of a ship through water. That changed in terms of the speed of a signal through a cable, which enabled us issue exchange rates, Brown's rates, which had um, been at one stage determined on a weekly or monthly basis, could now be determined on two or three hourly basis. So news of war, news of supply, news of damage to goods, news of, uh, of different information influenced the rate of exchange between the dollar and the, uh, and, and the pound. So 1866 might have been about the last time in the last century that the Brown brothers thought about Ireland. Um, the Browns uh, passed out. Alexander Brown died in 1837. His sons went on to conduct business. William became a leading light member of parliament in 
in Britain. He was very involved in civic life in Liverpool. But the connection to Ireland faded. And Brands, Brown Brothers would never, perhaps, have thought in anything other than a sentimental way about Ireland in the past. A couple of years ago, I was very interested in the work of a guy called Joseph, or Joseph Campbell, who wrote under the name Joseph McCawweed. And Joseph Campbell, I own his cottage in Wicklow in Lacandara, and uh, he was a, an Irish poet, a failed revolutionary, a member of Wicklow County Council. Um, all these things are interrelated, I'm sure, at some, uh, at, at some, at some stage. Um, but he had managed to get uh, work published on the Abbey stage. He formed uh, the Ulster Theatre at the same time the Abbey Theatre had been formed. He's a very interesting, interesting guy. And he was part of that kind of great creation of cultural forces at the, t at the early turn of the century, trying to define an Irish nationalism. Uh, he worked with a guy called Bulmer Hobson, who was also a northern writer, a very interesting kind of guy. And in 1929, this book was published. I was interested in this book because it, uh, Bulmer Hobson was hired to write it. It's kind of the equivalent of a YouTube IDA promotional video of the time. Um, it describes the commercial delights of Dublin. It describes the civic areas. It has beautiful illustrations by Harry Kernoff, Morris McGonagall, Estella Solomons of places of interest. It talks about the commercial life of the city, um, about how beautiful and amazing the commerce uh, availability is in Dublin which it describes as the natural commercial and distributing center for the Irish free state, which is supported, now this may be exaggeration for marketing purposes, in every direction, 1929, with splendid modern roads branching out to carry passengers and goods to the most remote districts. I'm not sure that this is truth in labeling in this uh, particular piece. Um, but it then importantly goes on to describe uh, an effort to think about globalization and trade. On the question of tariffs, the Irish government has adopted a system of selective protection. The Tariff Commission has authorized the establishment uh, to consist of three members, one to be nominated by the Minister of Finance, one by the Minister for Industry and Commerce, and one by the Ministry, Minister for Agriculture. Um, and the real ap approval of this was to try and understand whether you could encourage industrialists to begin manufacturing in Ireland and then protect the goods that they had produced uh, by uh, beneficial tariffs. Uh, well, in 1929, reflecting the religiosity of the era the, and perhaps the raw input that was taken into the Irish economy, the three examples that they choose to illustrate the effectiveness of the tariff regime here are the tariffs which have already been imposed at the instance of the Tariff Commission are, number one, rosary beads, a duty of 33 and a third percent ad valorem. Number two, a delectable foodstuff, margarine, a duty of threepence per pound. And finally, woolens and worsteds, a duty of 25 percent ad valorem. So the government at that stage, in an outbound view, its participation was really thinking about uh, this as a trading opportunity. What fascinated me about this book, and it was the after point though, was this section. This is an appendix, and it, and it shows the then developing dock of Dublin, um, which hadn't, the Alexander Basin had been fully uh, brought out, and it's, a, it's really quite a remarkable afterthought. Right, that, selfie moment. <laughs> I'll be on the minister's Instagram feed. <laughs> Um, but it, here's what it said. Since the establishment of the Irish government in 1921, a new, era, a new era of industrial activity has begun in Dublin. The government has embarked on the settled policy of building up an industrial state. And in the last few years, many new factories have been built and industries started. All new industries can rely upon the fostering care of government and tariff barriers against outside competition have been granted in many cases and can be secured in every case that's warranted by the circumstances. Here's the bit that I kind of liked. This new situation makes Dublin a place of interest to industrialists, not alone in Ireland, but in Europe and America. And several foreign firms have already started branch factories or new industries inside our tariff barriers. 
Now, I don't think you have to be a major economic historian to realize that 1929 is a pretty bad year to start a uh, export orientation. Um, this is running into the worst forces of economic history at the time. Um, and in some many ways, the, uh, the temporal failure, the uh, environmental failure of the policy at the time to encourage the level of industrialization that was expected because of the protective nature, the protective barriers that existed around that time pre-exist and it becomes a very uh, difficult task to achieve. That's why I think when you roll the clock forward 60 years, this becomes something of a risible derisory idea. And it's a thing that brings me 30 years later into this room. Uh, Dermot Desmond in the mid-1980s had commissioned a piece of work uh, when he was with NCB, which said, there's a technological change that could occur here uh, that's occurring in financial markets, dematerialization is occurring, and electronic access to financial services is probably capable. The telecommunication infrastructure is, may, may make life different. We can engage in an act of renewal and set up something called the Customs House Docks Develop Authority and begin to think, if we build it, they might come. And so there was an idea at that time that infrastructure around urban regeneration would be encouraging to international banks and international people and that the subsidization, in many ways, of the idea was there. Similar to the Corporation of Dublin back in 1929, there's very great interest in the exercise of soft power in this process. Um, the book is a masterpiece of production, 30 years old. I think it absolutely still stands the test of time. And it contains great little vignettes and beautiful quotations and maps. And it relies very much on the historic context of Dublin, uh, its participation in the flow of ideas. It's, it's the home of Swift and Burke. Uh, it's the home of poets and writers. It's a Joycean desire. And Derek Mahan has a poem in it. The light that left you streaks the walls of Georgian houses pubs, cathedrals, coasters, moored below Butt Bridge, and old men at the water's edge, where Anna Livia, breathing free, weeps silently into the sea, her small sorrows mingling with the wandering waters of the earth. Now, I've been a banker for 30 years, and I don't know a single banker who made a decision on the back of a poem. Um, <laughs> they have been interested. Brendan Behan is quoted in it, and he says, uh, a city is a place where you wouldn't be bitten by a wild sheep. <laughs> I think this is as true today as when he said it. <laughs> the bit that's important in this book is in the appendix in the last bit. And it's not about buildings, and it's not about the soft cultural capabilities of the Irish. It's actually about the hard facts of the things that permit you to participate in global markets. Special Incentives for the International Financial Services, Section 28 of the Finance Bill, 1987. And then it goes on to designate the activities which may be viewed as subject to uh, the encouragement of this participation in the, in the process. It, the section specifies that a trading operation is relevant and available to avail of the 10% favorable tax for manufacturing that was there in place for the provision of services. If the minister is satisfied that it will contribute to the development of the area, that the provision is for persons not ordinarily resident in the state, for transactions in relation to foreign currencies, uh, the carrying on of global money management, international dealings in foreign currencies, dealings in bonds, equities, and similar instruments, insurance and related activities, the development or supply of computer software for the use and provision of services facilitated to a type referred, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This was the imagining of it's more than buildings, it's more than process. You actually have to have a legislative and statutory and regulatory underpinning for participation in global markets. Now, my personal entry into the story, um, I'm sorry for the image of this, um, but my late father, uh, when he was retiring as chairman of the Revenue Commissioners, became chairman of the Customs House Docks Development Authority. And when I was doing my leaving cert in 1987, he came home with this picture in a book which showed Sheriff Street. Now, everyone who's of an age who you know what Sheriff Street was like in 1987 would see that this is Sheriff Street as imagined 
It's a beautiful docklands. There are yachts. There are happy yuppies drinking cappuccinos by the side. There are people shouting in their phones, being Gordon Gecko, imagining themselves to be participating in this glorious golden era of globalization and, and modernization. Needless to say, it seemed implausible. It seemed like a very different idea. But nonetheless, it actually was realized. When I'm crossing over the bridge going to the airport every week, and I look down the docks, and I think, and I look at the buildings and the businesses that are there. I see JP Morgan Bank, State Street Bank, Citibank, Bank of New York. Um, I see the asset management firms who are coming in, Vanguard, Goldman Sachs, etc. I realize that this is not some magical underpinning that drives this. There's actually a building there on the left, the Central Bank of Ireland, in its glorious golden um, framing, framing work. It clearly has rid itself of the karma of Anglo-Irish and is now um, occupying a really important central role in the reason about how Ireland is going to govern or succeed in this area. Because it's a dull thing that underwrites this. It's not glass architecture, it's the interplay of legislative frameworks, complex European regulation, and good public policy that enables this happen. Now, it's the summertime, nobody really wants to hear a lecture on the undertakings for collective investments and transfer of the securities directive, and nobody wants to hear about the alternative investment fund management directive, nobody wants to hear about the third, fourth, fifth iteration of those legislative frameworks, or, although maybe I've misread the audience, but the, um, this is the dirt, this is the detail that actually makes the buildings grow from the ground. Because this is the legislative interplay that allows you passport services across the globe. This is the legislative framework because of its recognition within the EU, allows me to go to the superintendent of pensions in Santiago in Chile and describe why Irish domiciled investment funds are eligible for the Chilean mandatory pens pension scheme. So General Pinochet, one of the only things that he did right was institute a mandatory pension system in Chile. So 5% of, of all earnings have got to go into long-term defined, uh, defined uh, um, contribution investments in the Chilean market in Colombia and Peru. That's a marketplace for Ireland. You go to the CSRC and the CBRC, who are the Chinese banking and securities regulators, and they're trying to find out how they replicate the a success of USITS and AIFMD in the European regulatory framework. And um, I had the privilege of traveling with the then Tishop Brian Cowan, and, uh, the head of the central bank, and signing a memorandum of understanding between Ireland and those, those regulators. Because it is that convergence, that interplay, that becomes important. 1929 again, the Great Crash caused a, a degree of thinking uh, under what was called the PCORA Commission, which is actually how did this happen? What was the infrastructure of the play that happened in the marketplace in the US? And they said that actually markets need to be regulated. There's a great light book by a guy called Fred Schwed, who was a trader in 1929, called Where Are the Customers' Yachts? It's based on an apocryphal story about a guy being brought down to Wall Street and he was pointing out, and somebody was going, oh, there's J.P. Morgan's yacht, and there's Rockefeller's yacht, and there's so-and-so yacht. And he turns to his companion, and he goes, where are the customer's yachts? You know, that, and it was the idea that actually a free market actually thrives with a degree of supervision and regulation. And so in the United States, the Securities Act to 1933, uh, the 40 Acts, as they know, the Investment Company Act and the Investment Advisory Act, became this extraordinary infrastructure for savings in America. And Fred Schwed in that book, which was published in 1931 and again in 1940, he said the only revision that he would made is that he'd wished he believed in the compounding power of the mutual fund. He said that actually had he diversified his risk and invested broadly in the market, he wouldn't have lost all the money. And this is the industry, the global mutual fund industry, that it arrives out of the USITS directive and drives all of those banks and others to be participating in Irish life and, and magnifying their presence around the world. This is why, though, things like Brexit seem to me to be so puzzling. Um, if I can bring them up here now. These are the two specters of the financial crisis. On the left is the ghost of Bernie Madoff, a man who ran an extraordinary and horrifying uh, Ponzi scheme that operated in the United States and in 
and Europe. Um, and a $22 billion investment infrastructure turned out to be made of very little, um, although remarkably, remarkably the, uh, they've recovered quite a lot of the money through meticulous detailed uh, legal work over the course of the last decade. But Madoff's crime sent a shockwave in, into the marketplace that el electronic assets mightn't actually be what they are purported to be. And the other individual is Dick Fold, who is the CEO of Lehman Brothers. And Lehman Brothers' collapse engendered this extraordinary view about the interoperability and the interdependence of global capital markets and how one was supposed to react to that. And so in the post-crisis regulatory environment, this is the domain of regulatory convergence under the principles of the G20, under the principles of supernatural bodies like IOSCO, where Ireland, importantly, has a seat as an OECD member, as a member of the European Union, and as a, a kind of a decent global citizen. And when people talk about the opacity of regulation and the obscurity, it's really a question about how would you engage in the detail of all these things. This is a bewildering array of expense that's been imposed on the financial uh, system post the crisis between 2008 and 2018. Or, and, and today. And there's an extraordinary infrastructure in Europe under the European supervisory, me supervisory me mechanisms. ESMA, the European Securities and Markets uh, Authority, I sat on their advisory board for a period of time. It, let me tell you, is less fun than you think. Um, <laughs> sitting and wading through legislative recommendations and asking for the, the response of, of industry to certain re legislative enhancements or statutory enhancements. It's meticulous, painstaking, involved work. I don't know if anyone watched the Brexit program with Guy Verhofstadt uh, during the week. Very interesting, the Brexit uh, program. And you began to see those little uh, Brussels and Strasbourg rooms. ESMA is based in Paris. And that's how democracy works, slowly and painfully and in great detail. And this is the advantage, not shiny buildings, not in, uh, in great infrastructure. It's in the proper intersection of public policy, expertise, and capital. And you see that in transatlantic cables, and you see it actually in the manifestation of properly regulated industries. Contrary to uh, all, all news, some bankers actually embrace regulation. We think that it's really important guardrail in terms of how investors are protected, retail investors, institutional investors, and how the flow of capital across borders works. We were engaged in that flow of capital back in 1866, and we're still in it today. You might ask, well, surely it's just the bankers who benefit from that. Um, I was involved in an association, I was its chairman in 2009, that was a real fun year, um, of the Irish Funds Industry Association. Uh, and one would say that we're always going to talk our own book, because you should, it's your own book. But the, we assessed independently from Indicon an assessment of the impact of financial services on Ireland. We said, well, what, what does it bloody matter? You know, could we strike it with the way of a pen? Actually, it matters to the 16,000 people who work directly in it. It matters to the 32,000 people who are indirectly affected uh, in total by the market. It matters to the economy in the sense that there's $7 billion of gross value associated with the activity provided by these firms, $9 billion worth of revenue, and significant amount of high-value employment. That building on Herbert Street has 250 people working for me for the last 20 years in there um, who contribute and participate in this contribution of nearly $900 million or euros worth of tax to the Irish economy, never mind the ancillary benefits of that activity in the economy more broadly. So I do think it matters, that the details matter. And this uh, populist attack on public servants, this populist attack on policymakers is really detrimental to the actual rights that we enjoy individually and the freedoms that we have, I think. And so these pictures from Loving Dublin, uh, which show this idealized glass-walled city in Dublin, which people find to be an abhorrence, is really part of the lifeblood of an economy. There are people working behind those windows. There are people traveling. There, there are two million people in employment. One million, 1.2 million more than when I began in 1990. 
I always kind of say to people, that's a million cups of coffee a day, that's a million more sandwiches, that's a million more commutes to work and a million more households being supported out of. This is not a bad thing. I'm not an unthinking advocate for globalization. I'm sure there's going to be some consideration about the negative effect of it. But the outcome is positive. This is better than Sheriff Street in 1987. Let me tell you. This is better than the keys were at the point. People going to work, people who have the opportunity to live in the country that they were brought up in, to live in a global economy. And ultimately, the bloody yacht appeared. So my, <laughs> the super yacht finally appeared on the keys 30 years later. So participation matters. I'm not sure being on a yacht matters. But the infrastructure and the communication involved in that, the history and continuance of participation in a rules-based economy produces very beneficial results. And I was very happy to be able to share some of my thoughts on that process with you here this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you.